Hello. In this video, we'll be looking at some aspects of helicopter performance, which are either misunderstood or pilots tend to be complacent about them. All of them involve operations where power is limited, either because of engine failure or because of high density altitude conditions. Firstly, we'll be looking at equivalent category A takeoff maneuvers. Secondly, high density altitude conditions. And thirdly, hover operations. For equivalent category A operations, we're trained to perform takeoff maneuvers which meet performance class 1. Two aspects of performance class 1 takeoffs that are not generally well understood are continued and rejected takeoff distances and continued takeoff flight path segments. Let's look first at one of the most basic principles of category A operations the performance class one takeoff and particularly how much space do we need to perform this maneuver safely if you think about it this is actually something you should have a good understanding of even if your operations don't need to meet category a requirements yet it's something that many pilots have a sketchy understanding of at best this example shows a helicopter taking off using a clear area type procedure of course, there are a number of other profiles available to choose from according to type certification, but the general principle is similar for all profiles. If the helicopter suffers a power loss from one engine during the departure, at or after the takeoff decision point, then it will continue to accelerate until it reaches a point at which it's at least 35 feet above the takeoff surface, and the speed is the takeoff safety speed, or V2 defined for the helicopter type and profile. The horizontal distance to reach this point is the continued takeoff distance and obviously needs to be clear of obstacles. Check in the performance section of your rotorcraft flight manual to see how far this distance is. Typically it will be several hundred meters in still winds. Now if we rewind and the helicopter suffers a power loss before the takeoff decision point it needs to reject the takeoff and land on a suitable surface that can support the helicopter weight without damaging it. The distance used is the rejected takeoff distance, and again, it may be further than you think. A very common practice we see in this type of training is when there is an engine failure after TDP, pilots will decide on the fly to reject the takeoff instead of continuing especially if there's a long runway available in front. This may be a logical solution, but good CRM and threat and error management would suggest that the time to think about your intentions in the event of a failure is before you start the takeoff and not when the failure happens. The danger of changing the plan and getting it wrong is self-explanatory. From the end of the continued takeoff distance, the helicopter will continue to climb until it reaches a point 200 feet above the takeoff surface. The path from the 35 foot point to the 200 foot point is known as flight path segment 1. All helicopters certified as category A must be able to achieve a rate of climb in this segment of at least 100 feet per minute. As a standard procedure, Flight Path 1 is tested and certified for all helicopters at takeoff safety speed, and this is reflected in the graphs in the Regicraft Flight Manual. You will also find that the performance graphs for Segment 1 will assume that you're using the maximum power available, which will either be the 2.5 minute or the 2 minute power rating, depending on the engine fitted on your helicopter. 
One of the most common errors we see pilots make during training and checking is failure to maintain these two parameters of speed and power during a continued takeoff maneuver. If less than full power is applied, or if the helicopter is allowed to accelerate instead of climb, then it may not achieve the required climb gradient. On achieving 200 feet, the pilot needs to perform a level acceleration with the target speed of VY. On achieving VY, there is then a climb straight ahead to reach 1000 feet above the takeoff surface. This climb is known as Flight Path Segment 2 and must be able to achieve at least 150 feet per minute. The segment 2 climb is performed using a speed of VY throughout and maximum continuous power. Remember, to pass a proficiency check you need to fly the VTOS and VY speeds with the required accuracy, which for the FAA is plus or minus 5 knots and for EASA is plus 10 minus 5. For the next topic, we're going to look at two aspects of high density altitude operations, those outside the limits of category A procedures. Firstly, hover outside ground effect, and secondly, cruise flight. If you imagine a helicopter taking off or landing in the vicinity of obstacles, it will probably need not only sufficient power to hover outside ground effect, but also additional power to climb and accelerate for takeoff or to arrest a rate of descent for landing, plus a safety margin to allow for wind gusts and turbulence. In this example, we'll look at a helicopter operating at a pressure altitude of 8,000 feet and a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. If the pilot plans to ensure that the helicopter can hover outside ground effect at maximum continuous power, you can see in this example that the weight of the helicopter needs to be less than 2,200 kilograms. In the same conditions, but using takeoff power, the helicopter is capable of hovering outside ground effect at 2,460 kilograms. So, at a weight of 2,200, the helicopter would have a power margin available of approximately 10%. If the pilot were to decide that a 5% thrust margin was sufficient, then the helicopter could weigh up to 2,337 kilos. And for a 2.5% thrust margin, it would be just below 2,400 kilos. And of course, the smaller the power margins, the less safe the manoeuvre will be. For the topic, cruise flight at high density altitude we're going to consider a helicopter making the 30 nautical mile transit between Mexico City and Toluca. You can see from the terrain map that between the two cities there is a mountain ridge which at its lowest crossing point is at an elevation of close to 11,000 feet. So let's consider a helicopter transiting at 12,000 feet pressure altitude at a typical summer temperature of about 20 degrees Celsius. So at this altitude and temperature, and at this aircraft weight, you can see if the pilots need to shut down an engine for any reason, or if the engine fails, the helicopter is unable to maintain altitude. The graph shows the helicopter descending at 200 feet per minute. But look carefully at the other parameters. The helicopter can maintain this minimum rate of descent only if it maintains maximum 2.5 minute power and VY, which in this instance is 60 knots. If the pilots don't understand this and fail to maintain these parameters, it may be descending much more rapidly. We've looked at single engine performance during the takeoff and in cruise flight. We're now going to look at engine failures in the hover. Imagine a helicopter hovering outside ground effect whilst it performs a task over an area where obstacles prevent a safe landing. If an engine fails in the hover, 
what happens next will depend on the relationship between the power required to hover in this condition and the power that one engine is able to supply. Engine one out. Engine one out. If this helicopter has engines which can supply 160% of power at the two and a half minute rating, and it was using 80% of power from each engine in the hover, then if a single engine fails, it should be able to maintain the hover, as the remaining good engine can supply the same total power that the helicopter was previously using. A transition into forward flight in order to reposition to a safe place to land should only result in minimal height loss if the pilot maintains two and a half minute power and the correct rotor speed. So now let's look at a situation where the helicopter is perhaps a bit heavier or there's less wind and it's using a little bit more power from each engine to hover. In this situation, if one engine fails, the good engine can only supply 160 of the 166% required to maintain the hover. As a result, the rotor speed will start to decay and the helicopter will start to descend. During any attempt to fly away, the helicopter will inevitably experience a drop down before it reaches a speed at which it can climb away from the obstacles. So unless the helicopter was hovering at a sufficient height above the obstacles to start with, there is a real risk of collision. Your helicopter may have a published flyaway procedure which will involve lowering the nose and accelerating rapidly to achieve a safety speed at which the helicopter is able to climb. This graph taken from the performance section of a rotorcraft flight manual shows calculation of a drop-down height for a helicopter operating at sea level pressure altitude 25 degrees Celsius at a weight of 6,400 kilograms in zero wind. You can see that if the correct flyway procedure is followed the expected drop-down height is about 60 to 65 feet. So, if helicopter hover operations are planned to take place at sufficient height to allow both for the drop-down and a clearance height of at least 15 feet above obstacles, it should allow you, in the event of an engine failure, to carry out the flyaway manoeuvres safely. Engine one out. Engine one out. So, in situations where limited power provides the greatest threat, it's important to do sufficient planning and preparation to be aware of. Takeoff distances, VTOS and VY speeds and where you need to maintain them, power margins during hover outside ground effect, what parameters will enable you to minimise rate of descent if you suffer an engine failure during the cruise at high density altitude, and drop down heights and flyaway maneuvers for hover operations. I hope you found this video useful. If so, there are several more available for you to use or share as you wish in this series. Check out our website at www.focuscrewtraining.com. Bye for now.